So Alice, if you can mute, mute Joe and um, connect through uh, to Boyd Carney. Now Boyd is um, a Bush Regeneration and Volunteer Officer Parks Operations at the uh, Hunter Central Coast Branch of New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. And Boyd has a, a very interesting story to tell about optimising post wildfire opportunities to control Scotch broom in Barrington Tops National Park's World Heritage Area, New South Wales. Thank you very much, Boyd. Okay, can everyone hear me clearly there? Yes, we certainly can. Okay, I'll just share my screen there if everyone can see that. Is that coming through? I'll assume it's coming through. Um, yeah, thank you for giving the opportunity pr um, to um, put this presentation on. Um, so I'm talking about Barrington Tops National Park. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, it's approximately uh, 90 kilometres northwest uh, of um, Newcastle in New South Wales. Um, probably the best way to get there is either from one side of the park at Scone or the other side at Gloucester. Uh, the park covers roughly uh, 80,000 hectares and uh, also it's a world heritage area, mainly due to the um, Antarctic beach forests that occur up in the um, Barrington Ranges. Um, the New South Wales government has a, a Saving Our Species program. Um, it's a threatened species program and um, that, that's how my involvement started up in Barrington Tops um, through three uh, site managed funded species, the uh, Tasmania glaucophola folia, Diarius venosa and the broadtooth rat. Um, now those species sit around the montane wetlands, which is an, also an, a threatened ecological community. And then also in there that, that aren't funded through the Save Our Species program, there are, there's a number of other threatened species that sit around those montane wetlands like the Tasmania purpurescence, the um, pole blue eye bright and the Davies tree for, frog. Um, so it is a cluster of uh, threatened species around there and thus incredibly important. Um, I guess my involvement is with it is, um, is with Scotch broom, which is considered a major threat to those three site managed species um, up in the Barrington Tops. Um, Scotch broom, a uh, beautiful yellow flower. Um, I often get pulled up in springtime up there and asked uh, if it's, uh, I, I hope people come up and say, I hope that's a native plant. It's so beautiful. Um, it's not, um, it's from Scotland and, um, and around that, uh, that, those British Isles. And it's uh, an important fact with it. I've just put the family name in it. It's for Basie family. And um, why I bring that to your attention, I'll, when I started in this industry, you know, the, the wattles and pea flowers are also in the uh, Fabaci family. And, um, you know, people would say, you know, they're, you know, quick growing, they produce a mass of seed quite quickly and they're relatively short lived plants. And um, the Scotch broom, although probably a bit longer lived than some of our native Fabaci family, um, fit into the sort of same um, um, program. Interestingly, I was watching the news the other day and they were talking about the election of the Scottish Chief Minister and you could see the Scotch broom in the natural habitat flowering away in spring over in Scotland. So uh, much nicer in Scotland, but not as nice in the Barrington Tops. So what I've got here is um, a, a density mapping, which we did in 2009. We've been trying to get updated density mapping, but the fires uh, wrecked it uh, two years ago and uh, we didn't have any luck getting the correct imagery uh, this year. But basically um, on the plateau of Barrington Tops, um, we've got 10,000 hectare infestation of Scotch broom. Um, we have the uh, largest infestation in Australia, something to be proud of. Um, and if you break that down, 80,000 hectare park and 10,000 of Scotch broom, you know, it's one eighth of the park that's um, infested by that. So um, we do have a density, um, the density of that, that Scotch broom. Um, and it is, it still remains in some of the, the monitoring we've done recently, it still remains um, roughly um, at that level, probably pushing out 20 metres from um, that current infestation. I'll just draw your attention to the bottom left hand side of that map, the um, 
zone, 20, zone 20, 19 and 18 for when we uh, start to talk a bit about the fire. But I'd like to first just sort of talk about the about my work with Scotch Broom and, and just trying to get an understanding. So uh, the beauty of Scotch Broom is there's um, there's a lot of literature out there in it. It's a, it's a big problem um, in the US, Canada, New Zealand, to name a, a number of countries where it's become a, a, a major weed. And so it, with that, there's a lot of scientific papers. So when I uh, first got asked um, to undertake Scotch Broom Control up at Barrington Tops, uh, my colleague um, and I just uh, picked up a lot of papers and uh, read a fair bit about Scotch Broom. Um, one thing we picked up was the fact that you could just cut it and it kills it. Um, so the first time I'd, I'd sent bush regenerators, including back in the day, Tom Clark up to um, Barrington Tops to remove uh, Scotch Broom. And the practice was, was the general bush regen technique of hand saws and poison bottles, so a cut and paint technique up there. And we sort of read this paper and went, oh, that's interesting. So uh, the first year I started working on it, we um, had a big group of bush regenerators. And I said, okay, um, I don't know if this is going to work, but if you guys can at least cut it and we'll stop it seeding this year, um, at least we'll stop it seeding and uh, we'll see what happens kind of thing. So th that was quite interesting. Um, another one paper I really pick up on is uh, the paper by Smith, which which, um, which was a study up at, done up at Barrington Tops. And it broke Scotch Broom down to four different stages of growth. So stage one, uh, one to two years, stage two, three to four, and stage three, five to 10, stage four, 10 years plus. I think it can grow up to about 28 years. It grows um, longer in Australia than it does in its native range. So stage one, it only grows to 50 centimetres. Um, in one study, a seedling survival was as few as 2%. Uh, it doesn't produce viable seed. It will flower, but um, it, it doesn't produce viable seed. Also gets grazed and we know that cutting isn't effective. And um, basically it's, it's a stage where it's not a threat. You can leave it and hopefully a lot of it will die out, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Stage two, it gets to about two metres tall by, by the year four, um, and it gets as tall as it is wide. Um, so it's quite a rounded, dense shrub. It produces a lot of flowers, um, but interestingly, it, it still produces very little viable seed. Um, what we found is the manual treatment is, we're st the jury's still out, we're still investigating it, um, whether the cutting technique that we're using is, um, is effective or not. So there seems to be at that stage in that stage two, that three to four years, um, a green stem, brown stem sort of, uh, that's where it changes its stem color a bit and cutting seems to be the option. We've just done a whole lot of cutting uh, with a volunteer group and we've been cutting really low. So right at the bottom of the tap root. So again, we're investigating that. It's also a great time to spray it because as I said, it's as dense, it is wide. It's already shading out herbaceous um, vegetation. And um, so it, it looks like a good time. The stage three and four, I've lumped them together. Um, basically the difference in stage three and four is that it starts to fall over on itself. Um, it gets up to five meters tall. Um, it develops a woody trunk. Uh, it, it reaches seeding maturity basically at stage five. And um, look, in my, in my experience, just in the last three or four years in changing the practice up there, we've noticed a 95% success rate in cutting. We, we got a little bit um, more, um, a little bit more regrowth this year, we think because the, the La Nina year. So it had, normally we didn't have a dry summer, obviously but still incredibly successful way to treat it at that stage. And that's the stage you wanna get it when it's at that maturity. So it's looking really positive with that treatment. So prior to the fire, our work has been to concentrate and push that weed away from the wetlands for those threatened species. Uh, so in 2020, in January, the Carters Road wildfire, which started in a lightning strike down on the down at the bottom um, of the mountains, uh, crept up on in January up into the Barrington Tops. Um, I've left the broom density there, so it is a, my maps are a little bit confusing. So, um, but the hashed orange is where the fire burnt. So it burnt up the top to Mount Barrington, if anyone knows that area, and then spread through the wetlands. 
Um, I was in Nepal um, at the time watching this fire on the RFS website creep up and um, start taking out the um, plateau and I was, I, I shouldn't probably say this, but I was a little excited because I thought, well, this is an opportunity. Um, this could be a really good opportunity. So, um, so interestingly, um, the, the, there's the fire intensity map that we've got. It's relatively accurate from some ground, ground truthing that we've done, and we're just analysing that sort of information at the moment. Um, topography had a fair play in the intensity. Obviously, your ridges and your hilltops burnt really hot. Additionally, a lot of your black areas where the, the fire um, is ex was extreme is, was actually in the wetland areas. Uh, so the wetlands themselves, the montane wetlands, burnt particularly hot um, with that fire. Um, you'll also see some unburnt areas, um, unburnt areas, and when I show the next slide, it, it'll show you that they're actually the dense broom areas, um, some of the dense broom areas and the green areas. So what I've done in the next slide, which I'm still working on with my um, arc map technician to try and get a better it, it's I still find this map a little bit confusing but um, it um, it shows the broom density with the fire intensity layer on top and I guess what you can really see is that red coming out that dense broom and it's obvious when you look across those wetlands the fire raced along and stopped um, in a lot of those really thick dense broom patches um, and also where they're in the less intense areas. So, and where it burnt hot, it's, um, it, um, so we're in the hotter range of the fire uh, is where we had the mass seedling germination. So obviously the theory with the fire is that um, uh, with like, as with wattles and pea flowers, it'll open up that seed bank and hopefully bring up a whole lot of that seed bank. Um, it destroyed most of the mature plant and as I, went, as I go back to that um, different growth stage of the broom, um, we've got four years basically uh, till it reaches seeding maturity to try and take, that, um, take that, um, that, that out. In theory, you've got no seed in, the, um, in those areas and um, the natural environment should recover quite well. Um, as I pointed out with that fire intensity and that confusing map is that, um, is that the brew, there was large amounts of areas where the, um, where the fire just pulled up, um, pulled up um, with the broom. Um, ironically, broom's probably a great protection for the Antarctic beach forests. Um, so there's, there were large mature uh, scotch broom packs um, pockets remain. So our strategy over the last year has been to get in through those different uh, areas that uh, weren't burned and try and remove um, the scotch broom out of those areas by cutting um, to stop seed going into that area. So we've had great success. We've treated 600 hectares of um, scotch broom uh, this, um, this year, um, which is great. So we still have a few bits and bobs to finish off, but um, and we have to follow up like any good bush gen pro program. Um, um, so I guess the the big question is is fire the effective tool for Scotch broom control? I I'm not sure, and I probably won't know to five years. So we've got a whole lot of um, programs running to try and get on top of it. Um, Obviously, we're also trying to put more tools in the toolbox. So um, we're looking at uh, machinery, uh, things called green climbers, chitter mulching machines. Obviously, we're in a World Heritage area, so there's a lot of conservation concerns and um, risk assessments we'll need to go through. Um, we will be spraying. We're not taking spraying by any mean out, means out of the mix, so knocking back a lot of those large uh, seedling infestations. Uh, we're also setting up some um, really good monitoring programs. We're just having conversations with CSIRO to, um, to try and uh, they're, they're very keen to get on board with a, a, a national monitoring program that they're establishing and we're working with our pest and weeds team to really develop some um, large quadrat systems to really monitor the effectiveness of the works we're doing up at Barrington Tops. Um, we... Um, one of the main things we need is this ongoing effort and um, 
the big problem currently is I'm only getting annual funding. So one bucket at a year kind of thing. Um, I've been very clear from the outset of this project that this is because of the stage, the stages of broom growth, this needs to be a five year project. So that with, uh, as most of the people in the room know, will be the ongoing challenge. Um, one way we're working to, um, to make this happen is to um, have um, a volunteering project. Uh, Tom Clark's been up a number of times and given us a hand, as well as a number of other volunteers. So getting that community input into uh, the Barrington Tops. People love going up to Barrington Tops, um, absolutely beautiful area. And uh, so we'll continue to roll out that uh, volunteer project. Um, I think I'm just about up to the 15 minutes. So I'll um, say thank you very much and leave you with a picture of uh, one of our first trial um, broom volunteer projects where it was absolutely atrocious weather. And, um, and uh, there's a group of our volunteers who turned up and said, we'll work anyway. And uh, there they are soaking wet. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, board. Yes, we do have time for maybe one or two questions. So if you could say your name, where you're from, that'd be great. Yeah. Hi, Boyd. Uh, Jared Proust. Uh, any idea what uh, percentage uh, of the broom has germinated out of the soil seed bank at all? No, not at this stage. Look, I, look. tell you the truth, I'm not much of a scientist. I'm much more of a project officer. Um, so I am trying to get those science components in there. And as I said, we have a really good uh, pest and weed team who um, I'm a, they've got a new employee there who's just done a PhD in that sort of stuff. And we're trying to um, get him up there and uh, he's making links with the CSIRO. So um, the science bit is probably not my strong point up there, um, but it, any input I can get, I'm open arms. That's great. Another question? I've got one while we're... Um, looking. I was just wondering, Boyd, if we know the longevity of the seed. I, I might have missed you saying it in the talk. Look, that's uh, th there is some papers on that um, with the longevity of the seed. Um, I, I've been reading a number of other papers and it is one that I need to go back to, but I think it was about... Oh, I think it was about 20 or 30 years at least, um, but there is that research out there and there is there is a couple of papers out there and it is referred to a lot in the literature. So um, yeah, I'd have to go back and have a look at the literature, sorry. No worries at all. It's actually a really hard thing to um, research. Um, at, yeah, and there is a specific paper on it, but uh, I just don't have it at hand, sorry. No problem, <laughs> that's fine. Um, any other questions? Yes. Thanks, Boyd. Uh, Phil McKenna here from University of Queensland. Just with your future monitoring, I'm just wondering, um, are you considering using remote sensing? Um, it's probably too big an area for too much drone mapping, but there's probably satellite sensors that you could use to um, try and map the, the area. Yeah, look, we've, um, we, we try and update, we have a broom management plan. The last one was done in 2009 and we used aerial imagery then. Uh, we've been trying to get imagery for the last two years. So the fires obviously took over the uh, satellites um, last year, uh, two years ago. And then this spring when it was all in flower, we paid for it and uh, they weren't able to get decent um, imagery. But that, that's definitely on the cards because we want to uh, see how the broom's spreading through the site. Okay. Great, uh, thanks there, Boyd. Yeah, we'll so hopefully, that. hopefully next year we'll um, we'll get that imagery. So the money's sitting there waiting to get that imagery, and uh, we've got a lot of interested people um, wanting that imagery. So, um, yep. Excellent, thank you, Boyd. Thanks for the um, the delivery there. Great, no problem. Enlightening. On to the next topic. 